The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you in association with our friends at Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, where your bank really does matter. Choose the credit union, choose local, choose community. If the air was taken out of Cork's early season optimism balloon by the visit of me to Park Equive last weekend, then it was reinflated on Sunday when John Cleary's side travelled to Newbridge to see off Kildare on a scoreline of 214 to 7 points. The win sealed a crucial two points for the Rebels and they'll go into their third round game against Dublin in the Park on February 19th with a real chance to make an impact on Division 2 of the league. On today's podcast, we'll be joined by 2010 All-Ireland winner Paul Kerrigan to chat about the opening two rounds of league games and that stellar away performance against the Lilywhites. The Lilywhites even. Some headlines from elsewhere in the West Cork sporting universe. First though, and Kieran, starting with the Cork ladies footballers who were beaten by Dublin at Porky Rin over the weekend in what looked to have been a real thriller of a game. The game finished 4.13 to 3.15 in favour of the Dubs. This was a bank holiday epic. If we wanted a, a football game or a sporting event to really kick off the first St. Bridget's Day bank holiday, we, we, we got it in Parky Ring on Monday. Um, a thriller of a game. Like you said, they're Dublin won 4.13 to 3.15, but that doesn't tell the, the full story of, of this, this epic. A half-time... Cork trailed, it was 4-8 to 10 points, so they were 10 points down. And there was almost a meltdown by, by Cork in the, the second 15 minutes of that first half and they conceded four goals. So they, they, there they were, a young Cork team, as we've touched on, on this podcast in the last couple of weeks, um, a young Cork team, 10 points down against the mighty Dubs, but they were really star back into this game in the second half. And not only did they come back, Jack, they actually hit the front at one stage inside the inside the closing quarter. Unfortunately, Dublin came again. Carla Rowe got two late frees to just nudge them over the line. And it's um, Cork's first defeat in Division 1. They won the first game away to Mayo. They'd drawn away to Waterford in the second game. And now they've lost at home to, to Dublin. But I suppose looking at, at the bigger picture, this is a transitional phase for this Cork team. We had Orla Finn on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. She stepped back. Martin O'Brien has, has retired from inter-county football. Orla Farmer has retired. Emer Skelly has stepped back. On the, uh, Terry O'Sullivan isn't involved with the Cork footballers this year, and his woman has stepped back on her, of her own accord. So Cork have lost an awful lot of experience, and they don't have the likes of Kieran, Darren O'Sullivan, and Roshan Feeling um, back in just yet. So for them to run Dublin so close, it, it is encouraging. A lot of young players are are getting the chance to make their mark. And, and if you're looking for, for bright spots, not only did Cork have that comeback, and that shows great great character to come back from 10 points down, but some of the young guns are are, are finding their 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 feet as well, which is quite important. And Emma Kiley, I suppose you couldn't call her a young gun because she was there before. She's from Valley Rovers. She scored one three. And Katie Crook got six, six points. Young Orla Cahillan uh, scored a goal. And then you have the... The stalwarts, the likes of the Libby Coppingers and, and the, the Hannah Loonies, and Libby kicked three points the last day and was really, really impressive. So, a lot of plus points to take from Cork. They'll be obviously disappointed to lose the game, but this is all about building a panel for the championship. And a lot of Cork players are, are getting a run out. So, um, disappointed to lose the game, but there are a lot of plus points that Shane O'Neill will hope to build on for their next game in a couple of weeks' time. Absolutely, Kieran. In hurling, then. The Pat Ryan era got up and running in spectacular fashion with Cork 
claiming a last minute victory over All Ireland champions Limerick at Pork Aquive on Saturday evening. The Rebels fought back from an eight point half time deficit to open their Alliance hurling league campaign with a one point victory. Shane Kingston getting that last minute winner. So, Kieran, we're talking about uh, encouraging signs for the Cork footballers in a few moments. We saw a decent performance from the ladies despite their loss, but this was an absolutely spectacular performance from the Cork Hurlers considering it's a new management setup and they were eight points down to the All-Ireland champions at halftime. That's exactly it. In some ways, it's similar to what happened to the Cork ladies on Monday. Um, like the Cork ladies were 10 points down at halftime. The Cork Hurlers were eight points down. It was 16 points to eight. But the difference here was that the Cork Hurlers, <clears> not only did they come back, but they actually went on to win the game. And it's so important. Um especially for this Cork team, because like you said, Pat Ryan is a new manager. They wanted to probably put a stake in the ground and have a statement win to kick off their league campaign. And and they got it. OK, Limerick are uh, Limerick the All-Ireland champions. They're the best team in the country. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. And they're going to do their own thing with the league. But I think for, for Cork, it's so important to get these wins under their belt because it, it builds momentum. Pat Ryan is trying to find his, his best 15. He's trying to build towards the championship. And and the games that really matter come come April and May, but but this was this is impressive. We'd uh, we goals from Robbie O'Flynn, Robbie O'Flynn, and, and and Declan Dalton, and there was a lot of impressive um, impressive performances throughout. None more so than Patrick Horgan. He's he, he just keeps going and going, Jack, doesn't he? Like there's no end in sight to this man. He got a got ten points the last day, five frees. 145. He was named man of the match. Um, well, he was our Southern Star man of the match in a way in our in our um report in this week's paper. So big, big win for Cork. Now they need to back it up. They're away to Galway in, in Pierce Park on Sunday at two o'clock. I think there's the third coverage on TG4. Another TG Catter. Oh, TG Catter. I always get that mixed up, don't I? TG Catter. That's what they left to <laughs> stick in the mind. So they're, they're away to it's it's the first coverage on TG Cahar on, on on Sunday. So um, it'd be great to see Cork back up their win against Limerick and put a put back to back wins. Um, but regardless, an encouraging start because like the Cork ladies, this Cork team showed character. And we talk about it with the Cork footballers in a couple of minutes. They showed character too. So I think there's that's positive signs for the campaign ahead. And nice to see Nooses Town's Luke Mead amongst the scorers as well. Finally, Kieran. Before we talk to Paul Kerrigan, your latest last word column, which is available for everyone to read on southernstar.ie forward slash sport right now, tells the story of the West Cork influence on the current Cork City squad. So not only have West Cork athletes dominated rowing, athletics and rugby in recent years, it looks as though we may be facing into a golden generation for West Cork soccer. Now I may be getting ahead of myself, but Kieran is here to tell us all about it. This was just a, a great occasion for West Cork soccer. So what this was, it was Monday week ago. It was the Munster Senior Cup quarter final, Cork City against Castleview. And um, usually a, a game like this wouldn't turn too many heads here in West Cork, but this game was different. When you saw the the team sheet drop on on Twitter, a couple of West Cork names there. You John O'Donovan, an eighteen year old from from Artfield and you Sam Bailey, a 16-year-old from Bellinine, both started. And then during the game, the memory goalkeeper Aaron Mannix, who's 18, came on, while Cora's Liam Murray, who's 17 years old, also came on. So at one point, we had four West Cork teenagers on the pitch at the same time for the Cork City senior team. And that's just a, a tremendous achievement for all those, those four young fellas, but also for, for their clubs and the West Cork School Boys and School Girls League, because that's where they all started. If you look at John O'Donovan, started with Artfield. Liam Murray, he kicked it off with, with Skibbereen. Sam Bailey was Lyre Rovers and Aaron Mannix was Dunmanway Town. So they've all progressed up through the, the, the academy in Cork City and to see the four of them involved with the Cork City senior team. It's just, it's really encouraging for for, for soccer in West Cork and what it does, Jack, and it's, it's, it's the same as the athletics with the Phil Healy's and the Darabak and Healy's and with the rugby with Gavin Coombs and Fadeen Mitchell, Inya Breen and Laura Sheehan. What it does, it just shows young boys and girls here in, in West Cork playing in the, the school boys and school girls league that you can you can progress. There is a path from West Cork up to the Cork City senior team because we have to mention too, on that same weekend, Neve Cotter, she's a 16-year-old 
from Bendon. She made her debut for the Cork City Women's Senior Team, which is an incredible achievement for her as well. And she's another one, another one to watch. And just as a, a bit of trivia, I, I, there was a pre-season challenge game. The Cork City Women were taking on the Wexford Youths. And on the Wexford Youth team was a Timothy teenager or a DC who's actually Neve Cotter's cousin. So you two first cousins in opposition, but you two West Cork teenagers playing for for um, the Cork City Women's and the Wexford Youth team. So again, that just shows the 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 the, 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 the soccer talent here in West Cork. But like I was saying, um, it's just so encouraging for the for the young players in the school school boys and school girls league here because they can see youngsters who've played in the same teams as them now playing for, for the likes of Cork City. And if we go back over the years, we'd run in Hurley from Skull, played with Cork City for a number of years before he, he moved to America with Conor Ellis with Cork City and he went to, to, to Limerick. Obviously, the big soccer story from West Cork is obviously Conor Horan, who was uh, across the water and he's doing his thing there, 30 odd caps for the Republic of Ireland. So, um, the, the West Cork sports machine it just keeps churning out the talent Jack and it's good news yeah and don't forget as well Denzel Fernandez, who's also managed to make a name for himself on the League of Ireland scene in recent years obviously he's had some injury issues but hopefully we'll see him back in action very soon as well Kieran, this may be just a, a good chance for you to plug an upcoming feature in the Southern Star because we're talking about future West Cork sporting talents but you're going to do a deep dive on future West Cork sporting talents in an upcoming edition of the paper. So what can you tell us about that before we switch our attention to our main feature this week? So this is a feature we've ran the last couple of years and it's getting bigger and better. And the reason it's getting bigger and better is because there is such a variety of young sports people across West Cork. Um, so we call this the next generation. So this will be in next week's Southern Star Sports section. It's an eight page special on where we profile the next generation of sport and talent in West Cork. And it's from bowling to motorsport, from soccer to rugby, from, from rowing to athletics. We have them all in there. And it's some super talented young sports stars that we're just that, that are worth keeping an eye on in the year ahead. We we've ran the same feature like I said the last couple of years. And even from the 2022 feature, to see the success that some of them have gone on to achieve is is absolutely incredible. And just as a teaser for next week. And it just to highlight the talent in West Cork at the moment, there's a young Bethany Scarty teenager called Millie Condon. She's a 17-year-old who goes to Sacred Heart a Secondary School in Clannacilty. Last year, she was part of the, the Cork minor and football um, teams that won All-Ireland All Ireland titles. So she won back, she, she's a dual star that won All-Ireland football and minor camogie titles last year. She also helped Sacred Heart win All-Ireland last year. And just on Tuesday night, she was named the 2022 Munster LGFA Player of the Year. So that goes to show the talent that is coming up in West Cork. We've said goodbye to the likes of Martina O'Brien and Orla Finn from the Cork Senior Football Team in recent weeks. But there's a conveyor belt of talent. It's so strong coming up. The likes of Millie Condon are the next generation. And it's great to see them, see them doing their thing. So that's one definitely to keep an eye out for in next week's Southern Star. Lovely stuff, Kieran. Coming up next, we're talking to Paul Kerrigan. The Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Cork are back, Kieran. If we were all doom and gloom on last week's podcast, we're a fountain of positivity this week. I'm not going to keep the mic here for too long because we've got the brilliant Paul Kerrigan coming up very shortly. But before we hear from Paul here, maybe just give us some of your own thoughts on this performance up in Newbridge by John Cleary's Rebels. You say Cork are back, Jack, but did they ever go away? We have to ask ourselves that question. Did they ever go away? Was that loss to Mead just luring the rest of the football world into this false sense of security? Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, superb result for Cork. 13-point winners away to Kildare in Newbridge. It was 214 to 7 points. And why this was so impressive is Cork were coming off the back of that disappointed up and loss to Mead. And they could see the 314 against Mead that day. And we touched it in last week's podcast. It, it was disappointing because it was coming off the back of an impressive McGrath Cup campaign. And we all wanted to see Cork build momentum and carry that momentum into the league. But at the first hurl, they stumbled. But it's a sign of a good team that they picked themselves up off the ground straight away. They dusted themselves down, hopped on the bus to Newbridge, spanked the locals by 13 points to get their Division 2 campaign back on track. And I 
this is just a result that this Cork team needed because it just puts them back in the picture in, in Division 2. This was a tough game, Jack. We can't get away from that. They were going to wait the Kildare team that had ran um, Dublin to just a point or two the previous weekend up in Croke Park. And Kildare are favourites for this game as well. We can't forget that. So for Cork to go in and do what they did, get one six on the scoreboard before Kildare uh, got that, their first point in the 27th minute. Like That tells you all about the, the discipline of the organisation and the almost the tenacity and the character of, of this Cork performance. But as good as the first half was, they saw they finished the job in the second half, even when Kildare threatened to kind of almost find a way back into the game at the start of the second half. Cork held them off at arm's length and they saw, saw it over 13 points, which is a, a tremendous win. Sets Cork up big time now. Dublin are next. Park and Cueve, February 19th, 3.45pm. The Dubs are coming out to Croke Park. They're coming down to Side. That's going to be an occasion. Um, Dublin are after two wins so far. They're obviously favourites to win Division 2. I think they're they second favourites for the All-Ireland. They're obviously in that conversation. So this is a huge, huge test for Cork. But they're going to bounce into that game now off the back of, the, of an impressive win. So if they can keep doing what they're doing, we're not going to say Cork are going to win every game because we're realistic on this, on, on this podcast. And we know there's going to be ups and downs. But if Cork can put in another good performance, and who knows? Who knows what will happen on the day? It'll just keep them... Keep, keep keep them pushing forward. But um, I started by chat with Paul Kerrigan. I wanted to find out what he thought about Cork's bounce back ability and how they responded so well from that first league defeat to Mead. Sunday was definitely a pleasant surprise. I think most people who were in Park at Cueve the Sunday before didn't see this win and its convincing manner coming. But we certainly take it, Paul. This was this was a, a result that the Cork footballers needed against Kildare. Yeah, I think. Um... I suppose it kind of showed the form that they had in McGrath Cup kind of continued on and I suppose the, out of their three McGrath Cup games and their two league games was the Mead game was the game that was probably the outlier where they didn't perform so uh, very impressive reaction from the lads um, a really tough place to go I think I've played there once in the league didn't didn't win was beaten convincingly enough it's, it is a tough place to go um, and got a draw actually back there years ago but as I said a hard place to go and their tails were probably up after competing with Dublin so mm-hmm. huge character from the lads in fairness um, you know <clears throat> um, been lucky enough to come back on bus trips after satisfying away wins and uh, like they really have enjoyed that to get a good, such a good performance a good reaction and like a really big game to look forward to now in a couple of weeks time How important was it Paul that Cork responded so fast and so impressively from the Mead defeat the previous weekend? Um, I think it was really important from the group at this point of view I'd say more so than anyone I think like we probably all have been a bit, um, maybe a bit overhyped and really positive, over positive probably going into the start of the league, looking at the Grand Cup and the good vibes coming out of the place. But um, yeah, I think, I think from the players' point of view and the manager's point of view, like they've probably an unbelievable body of work done, uh, probably since second end of August, September, and um, you know, if you came out of a two defeats in a row, um, you'd probably be questioning yourself and what you're doing in the direction you're going. And so, um, I think they'll take great satisfaction and and probably great um heart from the performance, the result, and the body of work you know, that they've they've put into it. And, and they'll be just searching for consistency. You know, really, I suppose, you know, they had a bad second half against Mead. A good good enough first half against Mead and, and two good halves now against Kildare, you know what I mean? So, um, again, they'll want to carry that into the Dublin game and go on and win it. Like, we, we have a pretty good record at home um, to the Dubs, you know what I mean? Even when they were all conquering and, and we were Division 1, mm-hmm. kind of around 2014-15. Um, so, look, they'll, they'll have a go off. It. It's a really big game. And, and, like one of my last couple of years, we were in the, or the, the Super 8s against the Dubs and the lads were really kind of oh, hyped to play them and test themselves against them. So they, they'll go on and, and really look forward to the game in a couple of weeks' time. I'll be honest, Paul, at the, the, the me game up in Park and Cueve, I was a bit concerned to see the Cork defence open up a couple of times in the in the first half and, and, and the second half. But what a turnaround we saw within, within one week, Cork kept a clean sheet against Kildare, kept them to just seven points in total, had conceded 3-14 against Mead. What do you put a turnaround like that down to? Um, I just think, I think maybe Kildare, from what I've heard and read and stuff, like from the lads and like Kildare, I suppose, ran it and ran it right into the car cover, um, as opposed to Mead, who, who were looking for to kick um, the early ball in. And I think maybe similar enough to the Kerry McGrath Cup game, Cork just turned them over, they hit a brick wall, turned them over, turned them over, broke at pace and then punished them, you know what I mean? So... Um, but I'd say, to be honest with you, I'd say they were just probably a little bit more cohesive as a group. I think I thought you were there yourself, 
like one kick pass and we were fairly open against Mees and it just seemed like there was a bit more cohesion from the group um, and just I suppose maybe that bit between the teeth as well you know what I mean to like it, it could have been coming out of kill there with two defeats uh, it would have been a fairly daunting thing for the lads to be facing into the rest of the league so they might have felt there might have been a bit of a do or die there and um, I'd say they just kind of maybe that tight feel in Newbridge kind of suited them a bit more and they tightened it up and look I suppose as well as very impressive Dan O'Mahony and Mara Shanley have played about nine games since January mm-hmm. and they, they, they're they still going strong and that's a like that shows to their kind of fitness and the body of work that they've done and then positive signs as well like you had Luke Fahey with a massive game when he came on kicked the point and, and Tommy Walsh um, came in corner back and, and they weren't overall and they actually ex- excelled so they're after finding two backs there now as well to, to compete which is which is another positive to know really. We were chatting there just before we started recording and I made the point that Cork seemed to have a kind of a, almost a settled squad and a settled team so far this year. Like we, we've had a lot of players who've played in all three McGrath Cup games and the two games so far. For, for Cork to have that that settled group, that's so important. We think back to last year, Paul, and the injuries that riddled this Cork team. It, it was cruel at the time. It was so many Cork players were so unlucky. But touch wood. Yeah, I think was, yeah. The, the first... Yeah, sorry. I think the first the first McGrath Cup lineup, you knew they wanted to hit the ground running. Like you know what I mean? They meant business. Like, and that lineup has continued nearly the whole way through. Um, like, I'd say John John Clary and the lads kind of, I'd say wanted to set down on a settled fifteen. Um, the league, the division they're in, Division Two, was the most important division of all four, with the most at stake with, with qualifying for the Sam Maguire and that. Um, and I suppose John realised they they probably survived by the skin of their teeth and um, beating Offaly last year. You don't want to be just surviving, you know what I mean? You want to be looking up and pushing on, pushing against the likes of Derry, Mead and, and Dublin, these lads. So, yeah, I think um, they've gone from their strongest team or what they see as their strongest team right from the start, you know what I mean? Um, like going back to the game the last day, um, Kevin O'Donovan was injured, you know what I mean? He's been injured, carrying an injury for a couple of weeks. That, that was probably enough force changed. Um, I'm not quite sure what Sean Meehan's story was, but like not a major overhaul after maybe a disappointing second half against Mead, which is a good sign. And like there's fierce, like the likes of guys, maybe like um, Owen McSweeney uh, and these guys who were taken off against Mead, it gives them great confidence and great boost that look, the lads say, look, I know, look, it didn't go well for p- patches of that game, but we're going to stick with you. Like that's usually important, like, you know what I mean? And it seems to be with everyone, you know, and um, like, and it just shows like Chris, I thought Chris Old Jones was brilliant against um against me, he really tried to take it to him. And then he was taken off at halftime the last day for probably probably struggling a little bit for Carlo Mann, who came out and, and scored 1-1, could have scored a second goal. But, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see if they stick with Chris the next day. But there is kind of a settled, it looks kind of settled even 21-22, you know what I mean, the guys who are coming in. Um, and like even Mark Cronin from our own club was number 26 on the panel for the last two games. So I'd say there's massive competition to get into that 26 and then furthermore to get into that, that 21 who are playing. So, yeah, as I said, they looked like they wanted to hit the ground running. Um, they won the McGrath Cup, showed they mean business, a bit of silverware, and now kind of similar enough team for the last two games as well. So, yeah, um, no doubt going into the Dubs, Dublin game in, in two weeks' time, maybe the strongest team possible, I reckon, that, it, that they'll go for again. This is going to be a huge game. Uh, Sunday, February 19th, Cork, Dublin, Parky Cueve. Bring the Dubs out of Cork Park down to the east side. It's going to be some occasion... How will Cork approach this? Obviously, the lads will have a bounce in their step after beating Kildare, but how will Cork go into this game and, and approach the Dubs, who are the favourites for Division Two? Yeah, I think I think very similar to the to the to the to the Kildare. Like from speaking to the lads, they they set up the same way against Mead as they did against Kildare, and I suppose it just didn't come to fruition against Kildare probably or for Mead for for a number of reasons. So they'll have the same setup again. They'll have learned. Because it didn't go well against Mead, and it went pretty well against Kildare. Like where where they need to come and t- to find that kind of uh, sweet spot in terms of their defensive setup. So I'd expect to see the lads in the half forward line again, filtering right back, uh, getting that shape, and, and then uh, hoping that the the dubs like they don't even for a couple of easy goals when they have the likes of Conor Callum. I think Fenton has got two goals in the last two games, so there's a bit more firepower. Um, and to be fair, the dubs won't give away the ball as cheaply as the likes of Kildare. They'll they'll be happy enough to sit outside. And wait for that kind of eighty percent shot. So, I think we'll see something similar from Cork. And um, again, I think they have increased fitness, um, the last since last year, and they know of the ability to break at pace. And I think they did that against Kildare, and they probably look to do that again. And I think a big facet of the Kildare game yesterday was um they didn't give away cheap turnovers, kind of around the half forward line when they were looking to attack. So they, 
they look to they look to do that as well. And like Sherlock is is, is on fire, and um, mm-hmm. and Brian Hurley was, was probably up there for man of the match yesterday. So, um, and and Potter as well back to form like the two of them were taken off against uh, Mead. So they need they need Potter and Brian flying, and it's great to see them back 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 at it because they're their leaders in the, in the attack. Um, and then you've got Halamani now pushing for a spot as well. So they have plenty of firepower. It's just them. Um, they look to keep it tight. Again, I think seven points against Galera is an unbelievable target. You know what I mean? If you'd be hitting that in most games, you'd be you'd be you'd be very really happy. So yeah, I'd say they'd be keeping it tight and looking to break his pace and hoping to like say Sherlock and and Brian and and um Kalamani and Chris Oak can can uh, kind of work together and, and, and kind of combine for scores and and, and they'll they'll give it a good rattle. I mentioned there, Brian Hurley and Sean Potter, they were so impressive against against Kildare on Sunday. They had, I suppose, off-colour games for their high standards against Mead. But how important is it, Paul, that the likes of the Brian Hurley, Sean Potter, Ian Maguire, even Brian O'Driscoll kind of kicking three points against Kildare, that these older, more experienced lads really lead this team? Because, like we've touched on, there's so many young ones here, the Conor Corbett's, the Conor Mahoney, yeah. the Colum O'Callaghan's. You know, you've a lot of young fellas throughout that team. So it's so important. Like, like you, you, you know yourself from your time at Cork, that the older fellas set the standards and, and and lead. Yeah, I think um from the outside anyway, it looks like they've all bought into John Cleary and Kevin Walsh and what they're about. You know what I mean? I think you mentioned Brian Ian and and those older lads like the McGrath Cup was probably their first bit of silverware. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. look, they're at the stage if they're buying into it and they see it's good and and that like and they're putting their shoulder to the wheel, the rest will follow. And I think a lot of the younger lads seem to be really good, genuine lads, hard working, want to learn. Um, seem to be open to everything so I think the biggest thing is there seems to be buying from that older group which is exactly what you want you know what I mean you want you kind of want the older group kind of almost policing it for you you know what I mean from the management's point of view and they seem to be believing in, in what's happening and the younger guys seem to be really open to it and, and there's uh, some of them seem to be thriving like you know as I said the, the likes of Dan O'Man you know and, uh, and Conor O'Callaghan especially have really have really turned up uh, this year so far and followed that on then with the likes of Fahey and um and Tommy Walsh the last day. So, yeah, I think the biggest thing for me, it looks like there's real, it looks like a happy camp. You know what I mean? Look, and it looks like there's buy-in from everyone. And like, that's, that's a, that's a massive thing to have. You know what I mean? Um, and like, as I said, yeah, yeah, the leaders will, will and if they're playing well, like what you, you do want Potter and Aguirre and Hurley, these lads playing well, you know what I mean? They're probably their marquee names. Um, and if they're playing well, it kind of lifts the whole thing. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see. But as I said, from my point of view, I just think that it looks like, a group that's bought into what's happening and um and like a, a result against Kildare, like that would really kind of amplify that like when they're coming down to see to see it come to fruition like that. Final question. So Paul, we know division two it's such an important division because you've that talk and cup shadow in, in the background the no county wants 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 to be there. In fairness to Cork, like the, the league is front loaded uh Mead, Kildare, Dublin in, in, in the first three games before then, I think it's is it with Clare, Derry, um, Loud, and Limerick. So two games in, what what would you like to see for Cork for, for the rest of the league? Are we looking at pushing for promotion, or would would it be happy just taking mid table and keep building? Yeah, I, I suppose whenever you were playing, you'd always take it. Kind of the league is divided up in sections, so you play two games and then a break, <laughs> and then you kind of the, the lads might have a night out or or you know you might go train with your club or whatever, and then you reset and go again. Uh, and this time now it's it's three games on the trot, and um, so like this is kind of where it makes or breaks really where you're going to be. You know what I mean? Like so, um, the important thing is that as I said, like they just kind of stay consistent, a uh, bit, bit of an even keel, and they just believe in what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like if they if they do, if they're beaten by the dubs the next day, um, but they stick to their kind of principles and values, they're in a good place then going forward on to the next week. But what you don't want is to be beaten and some people throw the ties out of the ground with the way they're playing and so on but I don't think they will so I just you'd like to see that consistency um, as I said they have three games in the next section if they came out with four points out of six there you know what I mean I think they're in a pretty good position going to, to chase promotion especially when they faced Derry in the last game of the league so that's what I'd be hoping for you know what I mean Or um, I, I don't think it's beyond the a possibility they could get a result against the Dubs at home especially if they play like the way they did the last day you know what I mean Good stuff great to finish on an optimistic note thanks for joining us yeah. Paul You're welcome thank you the Star Sport Podcast is brought to you by Access Credit Union. Access Credit Union, funding dreams for over 50 years. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And Kieran, before we wrap up, we are, of course, 
going to preview this week's Southern Star Sports section. You've alluded to some of the features coming up, but what can readers expect when they open their newspaper on Thursday morning? As always, there's something for everyone. We have a really good interview with Melissa Duggan, the, the Downies footballer who who plays for Cork. She's a former all-star footballer as well. Um, I caught up with, with Melissa just to chat about the, the season ahead for Cork. And we ended up talking about her three-month holiday or adventure in Asia, Jack, at the at the end of of 20 at the end of last year so she just um herself and her sister michelle headed off to asia there was cambodia thailand for a month they did vietnam and a a, a, a motorbike uh, drive along the east coast there there was Bali, cambodia it was just the adventure of a lifetime three months but it was just a reset that melissa needed she's been on the go for for a long time now she joined the cox senior panel in 2017 she was a a pharmacy student up in up in Dublin. So she was up and down midweek from Dublin to Cork for training sessions. She was working as well part-time. She was um, playing inter-county football and winning all-stars and become one of the top defenders in the country. So it was a really good and really enjoyable chat with Melissa Duggan. And that's what that's worth checking out Thursday's Southern Star for. We also have a two-page special on the Carberry GEA Academy that's run every every year. For 13 year olds from all the different clubs across the West Cork region are invited in football and hurling, put through their paces from Paddy Crowley, James McCarthy, and Charlie Wilson, and so on. And we had a graduation night a couple of weeks ago, so we have a two page special on that, packed full of pictures. Really interesting read in Torres' Southern Star is the Bear of Men, Batty O'Neill, who had to wait 56 years to receive his 1967 Cork cross-country medal and this is a, a great story by John Walsh and that's that, that's worth reading in Thursday's Southern Star and as well as that we have the usual soccer, rugby and um, just on soccer for a second Beamish Cup had a, had a big weekend last weekend Clannan Kitty Soccer Club were knocked out Green Rangers defeated the B team as expected and we have all the, the news from that and we also have news of a big Sponsorship deal for Carberry Camogie, who teamed up with an iconic local West Cork brand who are going to sponsor teams from under 13 right up to senior. So you have to check out Thursday Southern Star to see who that iconic local brand is. But just on that, it's great to see local businesses supporting um, local sporting teams or organisations like Carberry Camogie. So well done to all involved in that. So yeah, there's a Hell of a lot involved and a lot to sink your teeth into after the first bank holiday of the year. Absolutely. And that will be available in shops across West Cork and further afield from Thursday morning. But if you can't make it to a shop for whatever reason, you can always subscribe online. Just go to www.subscribe.southernstar.ie and read the Southern Star on your computer, tablet, or indeed your smartphone for less than two euro per week. Absolute bargain thanks for listening to the star sport podcast and thanks as well to our producer dylan mangan if you enjoy these shows please make sure to rate review and subscribe on apple podcasts spotify youtube or wherever you get your podcasts slant tommel